Hello, welcome to the Monday, June 4th, 2018 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Augusta, Georgia. So as predicted on Friday, we got also updates from Apple for OS X and Mac OS. In addition, we got the usual patch for Safari, also patches for iCloud for Windows. And with having released the full set of security updates, Apple also released details about the security content of all these updates, including the updates released on Thursday for iOS, watchOS, and tvOS. As usual for Apple updates, and that again is why they usually hold back some of the details until they release the updates for all the operating systems, there is a lot of overlap between these different updates. In particular, WebKit vulnerabilities, of course, show up in all the different operating systems. For OS X, the details about the WebKit vulnerabilities are split out into the Safari update, so you won't see them in the OS X details. Among the more interesting vulnerabilities, uh, one issue was fixed that would allow an attacker to modify the EFI bias. Now, an attacker would need already root on the system in order to affect this, but then again, this is sort of the holy grail of actually getting persistence on a system. Secondly, the e-fail vulnerability was patched in mail, so have to see exactly how they patched it, in particular for S-MIME, which is really the only thing that mail does support out of the box. PGP is not supported by mail, so that's probably not addressed here. And a message bug was fixed that was already exploited in the wild. This particular message bug led to a denial of service vulnerability with iOS. So far, I haven't really heard about any problems with this update, but in particular for OS X, this update apparently does take quite a while to apply, and that sort of matches my own observation. Can take up to an hour to apply this particular update. And of course, last week, everybody reported how the VPN filter malware is taking over routers and how the FBI is advising users into rebooting these routers to get rid of the malware. Haven't seen any numbers on how successful uh, this particular effort was, uh, but it, the assumption here was that with the command control server being offline, the second stage, which will remain on the system, can no longer communicate and download the additional stages. However, the routers still remain vulnerable and apparently what is happening is that a successor to VPN filter is now again attacking these routers, particularly Microtik routers in the Ukraine and installing a new version of a VPN filter with many of the same characteristics of the original thing. Of course, at this point, these could be mere copycats. I think it's a little bit too early to definitely say that it's the same group that launched the original VPN filter in particular, since at this point, I would think that there are a number of organizations around the world that have copies of VPN filter and would be able to make small changes to it. Well, and if you want to get started with analyzing malware, one quick and simple way of uh, doing it is to just, well, run the malware. But not everybody is brave enough to do that, and it's probably a good thing. So Remco showed a little tool that's really very useful in doing some static analysis. Uh, that tool is Radar 2, and it allows you to do some basic static analysis on binary. Now, that being said, uh, one tool that comes with this tool set actually does allow you to launch the malware, but other than that, it has a simple assembler and disassembler tool built in. You can search for byte patterns, extract strings, so a number of useful tools that sort of get you a little taste of malware analysis. 
And I guess since GDPR solved all privacy issues for humans, the next target is pets. A recent survey of Bluetooth pet tracking devices revealed, and I don't think anybody should be surprised by this, that many of these devices are vulnerable and putting your pet's privacy at risk. However, the root cause of many of these problems may affect other devices as well, and that's Bluetooth Low Energy. Bluetooth Low Energy doesn't really require any authentication for pairing, so it's up to the application to actually then implement it correctly, and many of them apparently don't do this. Well, this is it for today, so thanks again for listening, and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.